This week I decided to build a little mini game where you actually get to play as one of the bosses. To make the boss selection feel epic, I wanted to build a character carousel with some smooth runtime data binding. Every time I rotate the carousel, I need to show the player some information about that boss and let them change it. Runtime data binding is perfect for this scenario. So today we're going to dive into runtime data binding from property bags to one-way and two-way setups, and we'll see it all come together live in this boss selector. Let's get into it. Before we start exploring data binding and see it in action on our boss screen, let's take a quick overview of the system that makes it all possible, property bags. A property bag describes the fields and the properties of any type T. Unity generates property bags so the system can enumerate properties of your type. Your type can be anything, a scriptable object, a mono behavior, or just a regular C-sharp class. You can grab the property bag for any type at runtime. For example, we could grab the property bag of the enemy data type. We could ask for the same property bag using a runtime type instead of a generic parameter. This is useful in tooling and data-driven systems if you don't know the concrete type at compile time. Once you have the bag, you can walk the schema itself to see exactly which properties were included. Why don't we log the shape of the property bag out to the console? Now, our enemy data type doesn't actually have any properties or fields yet. Let's take a quick look at how that works. All public fields and all fields marked with serialized field or serialized reference will be included by default. But you can opt out if you use the don't create property attribute. The inverse of this is to use the create property attribute. So here we could have a public property for health that uses the private field. This way only the public property is exposed to the bag and not the field that backs it. Remember that all public fields will be auto included and the same applies to any private fields that you've marked with serialized field. If you're using polymorphism, you must use the serialized reference attribute to explicitly opt in. And if you're using auto properties, you can target the compiler generated backing field directly, then expose the property itself to the property bag. Now, even though Unity's UI toolkit doesn't require you to generate your own property bags, it is using property bags under the hood, so it's important to know how to expose all of your properties and fields so that it can be used by Unity's binding system. We can take this example just a little bit further because Unity's property system relies heavily on the visitor programming pattern. So you can create a property visitor and override one of the many methods that it provides. Your visitor can visit a given property bag for a specific instance, and you'll be able to perform operations on all of the properties. This is a slightly more advanced topic, but for now, let's just debug out the values that are contained in this particular instance. Now, to use the visitor, let's just hit Control N and come down to the bottom of our file. I'm just going to add some code to the end of our start method. We can create a new instance of our visitor. For data, let's use this instance of the enemy data type, and let's ask the bag to accept our visitor. We'll also pass in by reference our data. Let's go see this in action. So let's Control P right into play mode. Down there in the console, I'm just going to scroll right up to the top. Here we can see where our for loop iterated over all of the names that were contained inside of the bag. And then if we come down just a little bit, we can see that our visitor went through the same properties. And here it's output the value for each of them. Now, once again, you don't need to iterate the properties or use visitors in order to use data binding in Unity. You only need to know how to expose your fields and properties to the property bag. So now that we understand that, let's jump back to code and make something that's going to work for this UI. I've already written most of the code that's going to work the carousel and connect up some of my buttons, but what we don't have yet is a data structure. So I'm going to make a new scriptable object here called character data. First of all, I'm going to expose a name to the property bag. Then just like we did earlier, I'm going to have a private health float, but it's going to be exposed through a public property. Here we can have a getter and we'll retrieve the health value but our setter will clamp it between zero and our max health. Then I need some other values that we're going to make configurable in the UI, a reward value, maybe a number of points, a danger rating, and some kind of string description. So here I've exposed every single field or property other than the private health field and our constant float of max health. So now we can use this structure to bind data between my C -sharp code and the user interface. Under the hood, the property bag that's generated by this type will become the link between those two things. Let's take a look at the code I've written so far. I've collapsed down everything in my character screen controller, and let's just look at the important parts here. If I expand the fields section, 
The first thing we see here is that I have an array of character data. Below that, you can see we're going to keep a reference to our UI document and the root visual element. The rest of this is just reference to injected dependencies, configuration, then we're going to instantiate a new version of the carousel and reference the current character data, which is the specific data about the characters selected in the UI. Now let's collapse this up and take a look at the next method here that's important, which is on enable. This is probably familiar territory to most. We're getting the UI component from this game object and getting a reference to the root. I'm loading up some custom styles for this UI, mostly because I want to override some of the Unity default styles. We have some setup for the carousel looking up some events, and then we come to the most important part for this video, which is to bind to the character. We want to bind this user interface to the first character in our array. So let's collapse up on enable and let's expand bind to character. We don't have to do too much work here. Notice that there's just some validation here. We grab the current character data from the index of our array. And most importantly, we set this as the data source for the root of our UI document. When we set an instance of the character data to the root data source, it propagates to all of the children. That means we only need to set it once. And of course, you can override it in any of the children if you want. Now, the last part of this is to set up all of the bindings. And that's where we're going to do a little bit of programming here. So let's collapse up our bind character, open up, set up all bindings and get started. Now, when it comes to binding, there are actually four different binding modes. The first one we're going to look at is to target. That's a one way binding from the data to the UI. And we're also going to take a look at some two way bindings where it can go both ways. So let's start with the one way binding. This is going to be the most manual, basic way you can do this in C sharp. First of all, let's start by querying our boss name label from the root. Let's make sure that it exists and then we can set its binding path to the exact property name which is name from our character data class. Then we can create a data binding object. We give it the data source path, again, name wrapped in a property path. And then we explicitly set the binding mode to to target. This means one way data flows into the UI, but not the other way around. Finally, we can apply the binding to the text property of the label with set binding. And that's it. So now when our character data dot name changes, whether from code inspector or anywhere else, the label will update automatically. Now, this is a lot of boilerplate when you have a lot of bindings to make. So I've actually created a helper for myself here. I can just pass in the visual element and the property I want to bind it to and call one of its methods. Now, some of you may frown upon using literal strings for property names. There's another way you can do this. Let's get a reference to our description label. As long as that's not null, we still need to get the property path. But here instead, let's do name of pass in character data dot description. Now, this is basically the same thing we just did. So I can just pass that right into my helper method. Why don't I click into the data binding helper method just so you have an idea what I've built for that. Here we go. Let's zoom in a little bit. You can see here, this is the same logic I was just using. It's just been abstracted away into a reusable helper. There's nothing too fancy here, just some public methods that make things a little bit easier when you're doing manual data binding. So let's come back to our controller class. So why don't we start taking a look at two-way bindings? There's not much different here, only the binding method has changed. Let's get a reference to my slider int, which I've named health bar. This will let the player change the amount of health from the UI. Again, we can check to see if it's null, and if it's not, then we can take some action. First of all, I'm going to set some properties on the slider itself, but then I can use my helper to bind this with a binding mode of two-way instead of two-target. This will give us the binding we need to go in both directions. Finally, let's just mark the slider as dirty right away so that it gets repainted immediately. Now, I didn't include all of the properties from the character data type, so I'm just going to paste them all in here now, and now we can go have a look in Unity. I've already created some scriptable object data and added it to the component. Just jump right into play mode here. We can see that we've sent data to all of the bound fields. And if I grab this slider, notice that it's sending changes back to the data. And you can see that reflected right beside it. Where we're also just showing that data. The add button is just sending an event back to C sharp. You can see the sliders moving every time the health changes. Now, when I rotate the carousel, it binds the next instance of character data type. So now all of my controls are bound to that instance of character data. I can adjust the health of all these bosses and eventually make it even more configurable from this UI. Now, an interesting thing about this system is that every single boss character that comes around is using the same character data type. 
and that makes this a perfect candidate for using a hybrid style of binding and it'll cut down on a lot of our code. Let's have a look at how that works. UI Builder has a really interesting feature. Notice that I've selected my root visual element and here you can select the data source. Normally this defaults to object, but you can choose type and now I can choose any one of my scripts. So I'm gonna choose the character data type and I'm gonna leave the data source path empty. The data source is gonna change every time the carousel rotates. So how is this gonna help us out? Well, let me select the slider. Notice that we've inherited the data source type. And now if I come down to value, I can right click choose add binding. Here, if I click into the data source path, I can grab the actual property exposed by the property bag, and then we can set its binding mode here as well. You can see we've got two way, two source, two target, and two target once. So my slider was a two way binding. You also have some advanced settings you can play with, such as an update trigger, and you can create some converters, but maybe that's a topic for another day. I'm going to click on add binding, and then I'm going to make sure that I save my changes in UI Builder. So this hybrid approach to data binding will reduce a lot of boilerplate. Because we've set up a data path in our UXML, we don't need to do this manual assignment here in our class. Let's just comment it out. Now, of course, we should probably do a sanity check. Let's go straight into play mode here. We changed the slider, so let's give it a test. Working as expected. And everything else is working great too. I'll quickly set up that hybrid binding for all the other properties. And then let's come back to Rider. So previously, as part of on enable, we were configuring all of the bindings. Of course, we don't need to call that method anymore because I've set them all up to be this hybrid style. That means I can also completely remove this method. Now, all we're doing from code is assigning the character data. Every time the carousel spins, the types are already defined in the UXML. I like doing it this way because it's a little bit less boilerplate and it works because I'm using the same character data type every time. Now, before we wrap things up, I want to take a look at one more optimization, and that is versioning and change tracking. Normally with data binding, you're going to get an update every single frame. However, there are two interfaces that we can implement to make data binding much more efficient. Here in my character data scriptable object, I'm going to add two interfaces. One is the iDataSource view hash provider. The other is iNotify bindable property changed. The first one allows us to track changes using a version hash so that we only trigger updates when the data source changes. And the other one tracks changes at the property level and can ensure that the affected bindings are refreshed. So let's clear out all of my properties that I had defined here. Instead, I'm just going to define them as private fields. And then I'm going to add one more, which is a long that I'm going to call view version. This is going to be our hash. Now to satisfy the interface, I notify bindable property changed. We need to add an event. This is an event handler of type bindable property changed event args, and it has a name of property changed to satisfy the data source view hash provider interface. We need to implement a method named get view hash code. Here we can just return the view version. Then we're going to implement a helper method here. Every time a property changes, we're going to call this helper and bump the view version. And then we're going to fire the property changed event, passing in this and a new version of the bindable property changed event args that specifies which property was updated. Now to make the most of this, we're going to re-implement our properties. Let's start with name. We've got a normal getter, but in our setter, First of all, let's see if it's actually changed. If not, bail out early. Otherwise, set the value and then call our helper method. Notice that the parameter in our notify property changed has the caller member name attribute, which means that we don't have to pass anything in. We'll already know that this is related to the name property. Why don't we make one more for health? Same thing here, simple getter in the setter. Let's first clamp the value. Then we have our guard clause. If we make it past that, we set the value. And again, we call our helper. So with this system, we're only going to get updates if a value has actually changed. I'll fill in the rest of these methods off screen. But one more thing, I'm just going to make all of our private fields marked with serialized fields so we can actually see what's going on. OK, let's come back into play mode here and give it a shot. I'm going to grab the character data for this first character. You can see I've been playing around a little bit, so the view version isn't exactly at zero. Watch what happens when I start dragging the slider. See that view version starts to go up. Every time we see that view version increase, we also know that an event is being fired that lets the binding system know that the value has changed. 
The reason this is important isn't just because we don't necessarily need to update this every frame. It's also because in this system, Unity boxes value types such as ints and floats. So if we were to run this every single frame, we'd also incur a boxing cost for every single property that was a value type. So I think that just about covers the fundamentals of runtime data binding in Unity without diving too deep into some of the more advanced topics. So if there's a particular aspect of data binding you'd like to see covered in a future video, something more advanced, just leave a note in the comments. But this is where I'm going to wrap it up for today. Thanks for watching. Join us on Discord if you feel like it. Of course, hit that bell. New video every Sunday. I'll throw another video up on your screen. Maybe I'll see you there.